Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Dan Malmer, and today I'm going to talk to you about two different design patterns, chain of responsibility and mediator. Uh, so to begin a quick outline, I'm basically going to follow the same format that we've been using for the other design patterns. Um, for each of them, I'm first going to define a problem that they're trying to solve, uh, give you the definition and explain how they work at a code level. Um, then I'm going to show you demos that uh, I made for each of them and uh, go over some of the consequences of each of these design patterns. At the very end, I will compare the two design patterns to both each other and to other design patterns. So first to start, let's uh, talk about chain of responsibility. Uh, so let's say we have a problem where um, we've made an app and it has this graphical user interface and we want the user to be able to click anywhere on the app to display a help message. Now, each object here, represented as these rectangles, are um, going to perform different functions, so they're going to have different uh, help messages hard-coded into them. Uh, however, um, some of these objects may not help have a help message, but um, rather than have the user click one of these objects and have nothing display, we would rather um, some kind of useful help message display. So the solution here is to, whenever you click an object that doesn't have the help message uh, hard-coded into it, then go one step outwards. Um, so if we're, for instance, in this object here, go one step outwards and try to display the help message of that object. Now, if that object doesn't have the help message either, then uh, we can keep going out until one of the objects uh, has a help message and can complete the request, or um, we reach the end of any possible um, any possible object that could complete our request and uh, we have to return some kind of error or exception. Um, so yeah, that's all I'm saying here. Let's say uh, the user tries to get the help message for this object here. Um, it doesn't have a help message, so uh, instead of displaying nothing, it's going to move out one object um, to this object here, which completely uh, encapsulates it. Uh, it does have a help message, so this is the help message that would be displayed. Um, same goes for over here. If we click this object, it doesn't have a help message. We move out one. Um, this object still doesn't have a help message, so we move out further until we've reached this outside green box, which does have a help message, so that's what would, would be displayed. Uh, so that's the basics of chain of responsibility. Um, Gang of Four has an official definition here. Uh, it is to avoid coupling the sender of a request to its receiver by giving more than one object a chance to handle the request. Chain the receiving objects and pass the request along the chain until, the ob until an object handles it. Um, so that can be shown in this little image here as well. Um, we basically have a client that makes a request. Uh, we have a bunch of processing elements that can handle that request. Um, the request will go to the first element and then continue to move down until the request can be taken care of. So the uh, type of design pattern this is, it's a behavioral. Um, it's uh, you know performing some behavior. Uh, and its intent, um, it has two main intents here. Uh, the first is to decouple the sender of a request and its receiver. Uh, and then a related intent is this launch and leave strategy, which basically says the requester can um, send a request and then not worry about it, which is related to decoupling, but um, it's this idea that the sender sends a request and then all the logic and all of the uh, details about how that request is handled is handled completely separately from the sender and the sender doesn't have to worry about it after sending the request. Okay, so how it works. There are three main participants in this design pattern. We have the handler, uh, which is an interface that um, uh, handles the request and optionally implements the successor link. Uh, I'll go in, it generally implements the successor link, but I'll go into a little more detail later about why it's optional sometimes. Um, there are the contract concrete handler objects, which uh, implement this handler interface. Um, there will be multiple concrete handlers in a chain like uh, that picture before. Um, each one of their jobs is to 
when they receive a request, see if they can handle that request. If it can, it does so and you're done. Uh, if it can't, then it just moves that re request forward uh, to its successor. And finally, we have the client, which initiates the request um, to the top of the, uh, the uh, handler chain. Okay, so um, looking at the structure here, we have a, uh, like I was saying before, we have an abstract class handler, uh, which, um, you know, forces these concrete handlers that uh, implement it to write this handle request method. Um, in this structure here, uh, the handler also has a, an, a reference to an instance of the successor. So um, each one of these concrete handlers will, um, you know, have a reference pointing to whatever the concrete handler is next in the chain. Um, and this is really nice, actually, because it means that uh, each of these iterations down the chain is handled recursively, which means that we can um, we can move these handlers around and uh, you know implement them dynamically. Um, we don't have to know the uh, the order of the handlers before we start. We don't really have to know anything about these handlers. We just have to know that each one of them will have a successor handler um, until it reaches the end of the chain, in which case it will you know spit out some error or uh, or exception. Um, finally, uh, like I was saying before, we have this client object. Um, which has an instance of the handler, um, which will be a, uh, you know, when it when it makes a request, it will make that request to the top of the uh, the chain here. So I mentioned in the previous slide that uh, this successor is actually optional. Um, in some cases, uh, I was saying that uh, that a lot of the time these this chain is the successor is handled recursively. Um, sometimes it's useful to actually know the order of these things. So this uh, successor instance or reference to an instance isn't um, always necessary. Sometimes you'll actually know the chain before you send the request. Uh, but yeah, that's worth keeping in mind. So to illustrate this chain of responsibility concept, uh, I made a little demo. Um, uh, the uh, I wrote it all in Python. Um, it's up on GitHub if you want to take a look. Uh, basically, I was trying to think of some scenario where this chain of responsibility would be really useful. So I was thinking about an office setting where um, you know the office has a bunch of printers and people are constantly sending print requests to it. Uh, now the printers might be different speeds and different sizes, um, but anybody sending a print request wants the fastest printer that can handle their request to uh, to do it. So, you know, you send a print request in, you check the biggest, fastest printer. If it can handle it, then print on that. Uh, if it's if it can't, if it's too low on ink or or something like that, then move to the next fastest and the next fastest, uh, and so on. So it uh, it really follows this uh, chain of responsibility. So um, so I wrote that. Uh, I'll you can take a look at it right here. Um, I wrote it in Python, which uh, isn't really the natural language to do uh, to do interfaces or this object-oriented programming necessarily, but um, but it does in fact uh, have a um, uh, a module that can handle these interfaces and make basically an interface in Python. Uh, so I wanted to try that out, and um, this is what I came up with. So at the top here we have our um, our uh, Printer uh, printer handler interface. Um, it uh, you know defines these properties: speed, the speed of the printer, the amount of ink it can handle, the current amount of ink it has, and the successor, the next printer in line in the chain. Um, it has a few methods for comparing, so they can sort themselves. Um, whenever you add a new printer to the chain, it will find its spot in the chain, uh, so it's always sorted from fastest to slowest printers. Uh, and then whenever it prints a job, um, the task of each individual printer handler object, so concrete printer handler, is to just try to print um, whatever job comes in, so how much ink it uses. Uh, if it can't 
if it doesn't have enough ink to handle that job, then it passes it on to that successor. Um, then it has a uh, function to refill all the printers and to output the ink levels. Uh, so that's what I have down here. Um, this concrete printer handler class, uh, which um, implements uh, printer handler right here. And um, yeah, basically it just does exactly what I, what I said just now. Um, pretty straightforward. So here's the main method. Um, it, uh, as you can see here, it creates the concre concrete printer handlers um, and adds them to the chain so that they'll uh, fill in an order from fastest to slowest. You can see the speed here. Uh, we're adding three printers, one with a speed of 20, one with a speed of 10, and one with a speed of 5. Uh, and then there's going to be two rounds of printing. Um, I added some sleep methods here, just basically wait functions. Uh, to slow the program down so I can hopefully uh, talk about it as it's running. Um, it will try and print these pages. Uh, any printer where it can't fulfill the job because it's too low on ink will just push that job to the next printer. Uh, it will then refill all the printers and try again with some uh, different page numbers here. So uh, let's give that a shot. So as you can see it added these three printers and now they're in uh, when it outputs the ink levels, they're they're in order here, um, from fastest to slowest. Uh, it's first printing 30 pages. Uh, that's going to be on the fastest one. There's 70 ink left in that printer. The next 40, so there's 30 ink left. Um, the next is 40, but that fastest printer only has 30 ink left. So it um, you know it moves that job to the next printer, which is P10 here. Um, it's able to print, so it uh, prints the 40 pages and has 60 ink left. Uh, next is 30. We're back to trying on P20. Sorry, it's going to move a little too fast for me here. Um, because P20 uh, still has 30 ink left, um, it's able to print that 30 page job and uh, has zero ink left. Next is going to print 10 pages. Um, P20 is out of ink, so we'll move to the P10, uh, which has plenty of ink, and that's what gets run. Uh, or the gets printed. So after all that, uh, these are the final ink levels here. Um, I run that refill method, so now everything is back filled up to 100 ink. Um, and now we have the next round of printing. So it prints 70 pages. Um, P20 uh, gets chosen first, so it has 30 ink remaining. Next is 80 pages. Tries P20, isn't able to do it, tries P10. It does have enough ink, so um, print, and you have 20 ink left. Uh, now print 40 pages, tries P20, doesn't have enough, tries P10, doesn't have enough. So we're down to P5, the really slow printer, which has enough ink, so it's able to print it. Uh, and finally, another 10 that uh, P20 has enough. So, um, so, and then there's your final link. So I hope uh, this little demo, um, you know, gives you... Uh, some idea of how this uh, um, chain responsibility design pattern works. Uh, feel free to look at the code on GitHub, uh, and I'm, you know, of course, if you have any questions or anything like that, just let me know. Okay, so um, back to the presentation here. Uh, chain of responsibility. Um, the consequences of chain of responsibility. I, I kind of color coded them with whether or not the consequence was good or bad, green or red. So the first consequence we have here um, is reduced coupling, a good consequence of chain of responsibility. Um, this is what we were talking about before, where the uh, sender and receiver are decoupled, so they have no explicit knowledge of each other. Um, and this really simplifies the uh, interactions between the two objects, or between the sender and the set of receiver objects. Uh, chain of responsibility also adds flexibility in assigning responsibilities to objects. So you can think about this as... Um, Basically, like our, our printer de demo was really simple in that every printer just had one job, which was just to print, or if it didn't have enough ink, to move on. Um, you can think about more complicated scenarios where um, if the requests are more heterogeneous, they're just more complicated, so certain handlers can handle them, um, whereas others can't. Uh, you can basically set up your program to have all these um, various types of handlers 
that can handle handle specific scenarios. Um, and it's like we were saying before, it's really easy to move these handlers in and out um, because of the recursive nature of uh, iterating down the chain. So that's a, another positive consequence. And lastly here, a negative consequence is that receipt isn't guaranteed. So um, like we were saying before, the sender doesn't know anything about the receiver. So once it sends off the request, it doesn't actually know if the request um, finished or not, or finished successfully. Uh, and like I was saying, when you're you know, sending the request down the line, if you reach the end and you can't handle the request, then that's it, you're just out of luck. Um, so it's just important to uh, you know, make sure your code has uh, it throws exceptions and um, you know, there's good coding practice to so that those um, those kinds of scenarios don't go uh, unnoticed, I guess. Okay, so that's it for um, chain of responsibility. The next uh, design pattern we're going to talk about is mediator. So again, we're going to set up mediator with another problem. Now consider uh, planes, you know, trying to land uh, on an airstrip somewhere. Now, um, you know, a plane trying to come in for a landing wants to make sure that none of the other planes are, you know, going to try and land at the same time. So really, the plane needs to communicate with all the other planes that it's about to land at a certain on a certain airstrip. Um, the naive way to handle this would be that uh, every plane communicates with every other plane um, and you know sends out messages to each and every one of them. Uh, this of course can get convoluted uh, really fast and um, you know planes might have different technologies they might um, you know have different signals everything like that so uh, it can get extremely difficult for uh, uh, any plane to know exactly how to communicate with every other plane uh, especially when you start adding new ones. Uh, so the solution to this is use this uh, mediator pattern where instead of every plane communicating with every other plane directly, you communicate through a mediator, in this case the air traffic control tower. So the air traffic control tower can handle things like knowing all the signals for the different planes, all the different technologies. Uh, so anytime a plane wants to communicate with every other plane, it will just send a message to the air traffic controller who can simply send it out to every other plane. So uh, that's mediator. The official definition from Gang of Four uh, is define an object that encapsulates how a set of objects interact. Mediator promotes loose coupling by keeping objects from referring to each other explicitly and lets you vary their interaction independently. Uh, again, this is a behavioral pattern um, and it has two main intents. Uh, the first is to encapsulate how a set of objects interact in a single object. Um, so this is this single object is just the mediator object and it's going to encapsulate um, how a big set of other objects interact with each other. So rather than the objects knowing how they interact with each other directly, uh, the mediator is going to encapsulate all that um, interaction. Uh, and second, it's going to decouple peers through an intermediary. intermediary uh, and that allows you to vary peers interaction independent of other peers. So you can think if uh, you know you have a big group of different types of objects uh, instead of having every object know how to interact with every other object uh, the mediator can handle all that stuff. It's like what I was saying with all these different technologies and things like that. The mediator uh, handles all that stuff. It's all in one place um, and it's just a much better design. Okay so how it works um, uh, participants for a mediator. We have a uh, mediator interface. Um, it's actually optional um, because uh, you know if you have multiple mediators, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more later, um, you'll want a mediator interface so that all the mediators have the, uh, the same functions that you need. Um, but really the uh, required object here is this concrete mediator um, that uh, implements the cooperative behavior and uh, coordinates the colleague objects or those uh, peers that we were talking about, like the planes. Um, so the concrete mediator is what uh, you know actually handles all of the interaction between all the different objects. And finally we have this colleague class. 
Um, this is what, uh, you know, these are like the base objects that are trying to communicate or interact with each other. Um, each mediator knows all of the colleague classes and all the colleague classes know about every, um, know about which mediator they're assigned to. So, um, so if it ever needs to communicate with other colleagues, uh, it will just send a message to the mediator and the mediator will send it out to the colleagues that it needs to. So here's the structure. Um, like I was saying before, uh, there was a um, you know abstract mediator class, but it's technically optional if you only have one mediator. Um, here's your concrete mediator class, uh, and that has references to instances to every colleague, um, and every colleague uh, implements a colleague interface so that it um, has well-defined functions that the concrete mediator knows how to uh, interact with. And uh, like I was saying before, every concrete colleague um, has a uh, you know a reference to an instance of the mediator that is uh, you know controlling its interactions. Uh, so now I'm going to show you another demo. Um, this time I'm going to talk about uh, so I was thinking about another you know design where um, where this design pattern would come in handy and uh, I'm really interested in swarm behavior. I just think it's fascinating uh, how animals um, you know move in large groups so seamlessly. Uh, there's a lot of research on this stuff. I really really recommend you go check it out on Wikipedia or, or documentaries if you haven't checked it out. But uh, you know in the meantime here's a uh, quick video um, showing some swarm behavior. So this is in Rome. Uh, these are just giant flocks of birds. There's tons of birds around there. And you can see that um, all these little dots are uh, birds, you know, like independent birds. Um, but they move in these massive groups so seamlessly. And the way that it works really um, generally is whenever a bird turns, every other, like all of its neighbors will start to turn and then their neighbors will turn and their neighbors will turn. So you get these like big fluid motions and these big waves of movement, um, which I think is really cool. So, um, so I tried to make a demo of this. Uh, it's really it's simple, you know, it's not anything complicated. Um, but uh, oh, so this, you know, it's works for birds, it works for, it's, there's swarms of fish, um, lots of things. Um, so uh, to try and simulate this, uh, I um, you know made a set of objects that uh, one object will turn or move, and then its neighbors will move, and then their neighbors will move, and then and it'll just set on a chain reaction. So uh, I thought this was a good spot for uh, the mediator design pattern because rather than have all of these animals interacting with each other directly all the animals just interact with this mediator object and then the mediator object um, you know controls when animals move and uh, how they behave relative to to each other uh, again um, the uh, the code is on github if you're interested so so here is the um, Swarm code. Uh, so first, I have this uh, class animal, this object animal. Um, this is the colleague class from that uh, that diagram I was showing you earlier. Um, uh, it it just has properties x y properties um, for its location, and then like I was saying before, it knows uh, the mediator that's controlling it. It has a uh, reference to the instance of the mediator that controls it. Um, it has this move function down here, uh, which will just make it move left, right, up, or down. Uh, and then if it is the animal that is chosen to lead, like to turn, um, then it will communicate that with the mediator, which will handle the actual movement itself. So now down here to the mediator um, class, uh, it has a swarm, which is, you know, a big group of animals. Um, and... Uh, it it has this function register swarm which basically just takes all the animals and figures out who's whose neighbor um, so that's kind of 
the mediator figuring out um, how these objects interact and, and uh, handling that in the mediator class itself. Um, and then it has this propagate move function that, uh, you know, when one animal moves, it will um, set off that chain reaction of all the other animals next to it moving. Um, and then it has some like draw functions here to, uh, you know, to print it out on the screen. So, um, so that's what the swarm looks like. It's just going to be a bunch of zeros. Uh, I don't have anything fancy like clearing the screen for me or anything like that. So, uh, so I just have this terminal just be really small so that um, it will all fit on one screen. So uh, this is what it looks like. So you can see these. Are, this is the swarm at start. Uh, it's going to pick one of the animals. Um, at random and then pick a direction at random so up left right or down uh, and then move that animal and then the mediator controls um, taking all its neighbors having them follow then the rest of the neighbors follow and then their neighbors follow and their, na their neighbors follow um, and it's this really really basic uh, swarm behavior and it's nice and clean there's um because of the uh, mediator design pattern um, it's not too convoluted, and it's, it's actually relatively simple um, because uh, the mediator handles, you know, most of the uh, the work. All right, so that's uh, that's a little swarm demo. Again, feel free to look at it on GitHub. Feel free to ask questions. <clears throat> so um, again, we're going to talk about mediator consequences. Um, uh, again, I color coded them. So first, the mediator limits subclassing, um, which localizes behavior that would otherwise be distributed among all the colleagues. Um, so, if you want to change the behavior of how these objects interact, if you didn't have the mediator, you'd have to subclass potentially many different objects uh, of the colleague objects. Um, with the mediator, all you have to do is subclass the mediator object. Um, uh, in addition, it uh, decouples the colleagues, like we've been talking about. Um, this uh, promotes loose coupling, which we know from this class is good programming practice. Um, it simplifies the object protocols. So, um, like we were saying, uh, the colleagues, if they were interacting with each other directly, uh, there'd be every colleague would have to interact with every other colleague. Um, so there'd be these many-to-many -many interactions uh, with the mediator the mediator is connecting, um, is interacting with all the colleagues, so it's this one-to-many interaction, which is cleaner. Uh, the mediator also abstracts away how objects cooperate. So um, by using this mediator to handle how all the objects interact, uh, it's abstracting away from how objects behave. So it's kind of separating out the um, the two behaviors, or the behavior and the interaction um, in the code, so it adds modularity to your code, which is good. Um, and lastly, it uh, centralizes control. So I, I made this one blue because it's sort of a trade-off. It's not necessarily good or bad. Um, generally, it seems to be good, but uh, it trades the complexity of the interaction for the complexity in the mediator. So all that complexity of having all the colleagues talk to each other um, directly moves into the mediator. So uh, this is good in many respects, but it's also uh, important to be careful because the mediator itself can become incredibly complicated and complex when, uh, you know, if, uh, if you're not aware of it. So uh, it could turn into one of those god blob monster classes that we talked about uh, in class and um, you know, you don't want the mediator doing everything. So uh, you just need to keep that in mind. Okay, so I'm going to end uh, this talk with some comparisons to other design patterns. Um, first, the chain of responsibility. Um, it tends to use the composite pattern. Um, the composite pattern, if you remember, is the, uh, the pattern that treats objects as a hierarchy uh, tree. Um, so it fits nicely with the chain of responsibility because uh, the uh, component's parent in a composite um, can just be treated as the successor in a chain of responsibility pattern. Uh, so that's used frequently. Um, for mediator, uh, it's similar to facade, 
Um, but the major difference is that uh, Facade makes requests to the um, subsystem classes, but the, the subsystem classes don't uh, can't make requests to the Facade. Um, whereas Mediator, um, it's uh, vice versa, so it's multi-directional. Uh, and it's common for Mediator to use the observer pattern, the observer pattern being the um, publish subscribe, which makes sense because if, uh, you know, using the observer pattern, you can um, communicate to the uh, Mediator with a uh, publi publi bleh, publish subscribe model. Um, and because I did the two uh, design patterns, I thought it was worth comparing them together. Um, as you can tell, they both decouple senders and receivers, uh, but they have different trade-offs, they have different uses. Um, chain of responsibility uh, decouples the sender and receiver by passing the sender um, along a chain of receivers, um, or passing a request along a chain of receivers, uh, and the mediator decouples by having the senders and receivers um, reference each other indirectly. So you can tell they're, they're somewhat similar, but uh, they're definitely um, useful for their, uh, for their own use cases there. Uh, so here I, I mainly used two references. Uh, the source making website um, was really great. It's uh, you know got nice, concise uh, descriptions of all the different design patterns. Uh, and of course, the um, you know Gang of Four design patterns book. Um, I used a lot, uh, and uh, here's again my um, email and GitHub. If you would, uh, if you have any questions. All right, thanks.